You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on KLOS. That was uh, Generation X, Valley of the Dolls. Then we have Roxy Music, Prairie, Prairie Rose. And uh, it's uh, 10 minutes after 12 bells. It's a Friday. It's the end of the week. I feel like I'm getting sick again. And uh, that's because I've been farting around on my motorbike for the last couple of days. Thought I was all well. I think I did too much. We're here with Mr. John Brewer. Hello. How are you, Mr. Brewer? Well, I'm great until I met you, and I think I'm going to catch something now, but um, I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Yeah. I'm good. You're very slick. I am. Your outfit. Well, it came from L.A. <laughs> you know, no one can see you on the radio. Okay, no, no. Well, actually, that's not true. We, we do film... We do film. Do film. Yeah, I yeah. saw a film with you and um, and uh, uh, Visconti. Yeah. Yeah. So, are you a Doc Camerian, Doc Cameriton, whatever they call? I don't refer to myself as that. I refer to myself as basically a filmmaker. Yeah. And um, you know, I've been in. It's great. I'm now being able to announce it because I'm 50 years in rock and roll. Yeah. So I'm very proud of it. I've actually made it. What What else have you done then? Well, I, I started out as a manager. When, um, when was this? What year? What era? 68. 60. So what, who was your manager? Um, Freddie and the Dreamers? No, but it was after that. <laughs> I had a band called uh, Tuesday's Children, Czar. And that's how I actually met David through a man called Lawrence Myers. And um, he thought uh, the record that we had was a hit and I started working with him. And that was Jem. And Jem were the people behind Bowie. And then Tony DeFries came in as a sort of... The New York guy. No, he actually was English. Was he? Yeah, from... Um, yeah, he was from uh, Golders Green, I think. Uh. And he basically then ended up in Shepherd's Bush. Main man, though. Yeah, he, main man was after that. He that, asked, was, that was in New York, then, people. Man, he then came out to New York. Yeah. He asked me to come with him, and we didn't agree on lots of things. But I made Hunky Dory with David, and um, I was the one that booked the gig at Friars. So you was managing that band? Sort of. It was a sort of gem management thing. But what did you do then? I booked the gigs and basically talked to the press and sat with David, and I was the one that used to go out with David. Are you in some of the footage of the of Bowie's documentary? Mm -hmm. Are, yep. you, are you in any of the footage? Uh, I don't know. I have to look at it again. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Um, I was on stage, but I never bailed beside stage, backstage. But in those days, it's the most extraordinary thing. I was saying this only yesterday. All of us people that were involved in management never bothered to have photos done with the artist. And I look back and various other people I managed and have gone. Well, we're living in a different world now. Yeah. Everyone wants it's got a, a picture. Camera. Cameras everywhere. Yeah. I had a lag the other day down an alley, and I looked up and there was a camera watching me. <laughs> yeah, right. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do anything. That's it, right. When, when you're when you're having a pedal on your computer, there's someone looking at you. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're going down shopping, they got you on some sort of screen. It's good in one way because if there's it's skullduggery, you can always go back and find something. You know what I mean? Right. There's a good, there's a good, good, good side to it, but also. You know, you don't. You got to be aware. You know, you, everything's everything's filmed. Yeah, and we don't wear masks now. You wasn't with Bowie when he was at the Amersmith Podium, was you? I was actually. I was. Um, I'd left Gem and I'd left actually. Uh, His farewell doing, gig. But I was there. Doing what? Um, actually, watching him. <laughs> you know, you wasn't working. With no, him. no, no. Otherwise, he would never have said what he said. Yeah, that was a big mistake. Because he didn't mean that. He said, it's not all over. I'm not, I'm not coming back. This is the end. He, it, was, it was all nonsense. Was it? Yeah. He wanted to, He just didn't want to do Ziggy Stardust for 25 years and play gigs as, as a... So what did he want to do then if he, he didn't mean... He wanted to go mean... and do what he did. Well, so he did mean it then? He, he didn't mean that it was the end. People took it that it's all over. No, I, I got the concept that Ziggy Stardust is over. Mm. He said, this is over. And you, you get that that's what he was talking about. Yeah, but the people in the audience didn't know that. Well, they're all 15. That's right. They don't know. Some poor little girl jumped off, you know, you know the Odin, you know. 
Oh, or, I know the Odeon. Apollo or whatever it's called. Hammersmith Odeon. Yeah. I nicked all his gear that I know. That I, was, I wasn't going to bring it up, and I know you, you offered 100 bucks or... T- for I gave him, the, for the, the drummer, I gave him 200... Well, how much did I give him? 100, Two, I think. Yeah. 200. 200. And you put it in his pocket. I thought, it's great. <laughs> it's like the old days. He only wanted 100. I should have just stuck with that. But why did you do that? Made amends? No. Take the symbols. Because I could. Okay. And I, I was a kleptomaniac. Oh. And I was a massive fan of, the, of, of Bowie. I used to nick everyone. Uh-huh. Everyone's gear. No one got out alive. I couldn't help it. I'm not proud of it, but that's, that's what I did. Well, at least you It was my it. connection to music. Because I couldn't play at that point, and I was always into music, and I thought the closest I can get is nick some of their gear. Well, there, there, there's, you know, I, I represented like a trophy. Al- I represented Alvin Lee. Yeah. And on the stage, he used to take off the, the jacket that he wore at Woodstock. He always walk on the same thing, the same clock, something. Else. And somebody nicked it off the chair, and that was the. I mean, I, I, we had to put. Rewards out. We never got it back. Where was and, this? Uh, this was in Texas. Oh, it wasn't me then. No, no. Texas. <laughs> so you got a new documentary out of Mick Ronson. It's the um, yeah. Was it, was, it on, was it on BBC? Yes. So I've I've seen it then. It was on Sky actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good. Mm, thank you. Did you um, did you have a, a relationship with Mick? A great relationship. Yeah. Uh, with Bowie as well, um, um, Mick Ronson was, I know everybody says this, but he really was one of the sweetest guys I've known. Mm. He gave it all his all, mm. and um, he, he actually did step up. Um, I mean, how many people do you actually see, if you look back at footage, that Bowie put his arm around on stage? But with Mick, he was like, he sort of was like, they were like sort of brothers in a way. And they they totally respected each other, but Mick was from Hull, quiet guy, yeah. very very uh, brought up very in a religious family, and you behaved yourself. And mum and dad were you respected them, you know. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't avant garde like no. All three of them, the mm. musicians weren't, weren't. They were like just straight goers. And and suddenly they're thrown into this situation, and David's going, God, God, come on, put a bit of makeup on. And, you know, Ronson. But when he did, I mean, as Angie says in the film, it yeah. was like, suddenly, where's the mascara? Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, like. yeah. So it was interesting. But I knew, knew Ronson, and um, he, uh, he basically was a lovely man, and he gave it his all. And what a great talent. And I think I made this film... He was classically trained, wasn't he? Yeah, that actually, he was classically trained, but he couldn't write music. And he found it really upsetting where Tony could, Tony Visconti could. Yeah. And he went away, and it was Angie's suggestion. He went back and learned how to write right. music. Right. And the interesting thing was he came back, and he could do it all. Yeah. And that's what frustrated him. He couldn't do it all, and then he made him himself. And that's quite admirable if you think about it. Well, it was, it was worth him doing that because none of them songs, not just with Bowie, but Transformer mm-hmm. and a lot of other stuff, I think a lot of the reason them songs are so great is the arrangements. Well, exactly, and as Lou Reed said in the film, you know, Lewis Ronson, he's good, he's good. Yeah. And, and, and Lou's vocal, he took it down in the studio and he t- left his vocal off, and then you really appreciated what the arrangement was yeah. on Perfect Day. I wonder why he never stood up for himself, though, Nick. Well, I think that, well, you mean by the publishing situation? No, whatever, or? with who, you know, getting, not getting credit for stuff, not bothering about credit for, for you know, this, that and the other, he just kind of... Well, I mean, I don't think he was in the business for credit. I think he was in the business for music. And he was, don't forget, he was managed by DeFries. DeFries tried to turn him into another Bowie. Yeah, he ain't, real, a, he ain't a front man, man. No, not a front man. And, but, and anybody who's in the business really properly and understood records and understood music and understood the business, which DeFries didn't, really, really wouldn't have done that. And, um... It was convenient, I think, that he didn't basically kick up a fuss. Yeah. Because there was all sorts of things going on. And that's what the struggle was. David knew it. And David literally had a struggle. And I think I made this film for David as much as for Mick. Because 
he was working again with Mick, and they had plans. And when they did the f the uh, concert for Freddie, yeah. um, Heroes was played, and that's a record that um, Mick Ronson should have really played on, and he played it, and he played it so well. And he was a hero, there's no question about it. And David knew that. And if you watch that footage, it was like coming back together. Yeah. They went in the studio and lots of plans were being made. And they just ran out of time. Yeah. And when he passed away, he was halfway through his album. David, would, uh, you know, there's a soundtrack coming out as well, any moment. And on that soundtrack is Bowie's performance on two tracks, lead, lead vocals, like a Rolling Stone, the Bob Dylan song amazing and um he was coming he'd got all sorts of ideas with mick what's that coming out on? uh it's coming out in universal uh, as what as a soundtrack to beside bowie as the documentary uh. this is what i'm trying to do i'm trying to why shouldn't documentaries have soundtracks i don't know oh. don't, don't moan at me i, don't, no. I didn't <laughs> leave it out <laughs> no. well that's <laughs> that's what we're doing <laughs> mm. so um you know and uh I think that uh, I think that when he died, Mick Ronson died. Bowie struggled again with this, you know, uh, non-identity for Ronson being the, a co-songwriter in a way, because he was. There's no question mm. about it. And um, he didn't really know how to deal with it, and then he ran out of time. And I just think at the end of the day, well, you know. Um, this then actually puts Ronson on the map and says he was an unsung hero, but it wasn't David's fault. And I just think that they were in it for the music. Well, it's a different time, too. Unsung guitar hero. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, he was, uh, he was my favorite. As a guitarist? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people have come out of the woodwork saying, God, what a great guitarist. Yeah, but I've always said that, not Johnny Cub Lately's. Mm. No, I think that originally, I mean, Morrissey, you know. Yeah, he produced a, 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 a Morrissey album, didn't he? Yeah. Your Arsenal. Yeah. That was great. And, and, <coughs> and the fact is, Morrissey swears that, you know, he was the engine to Bowie. Mm -hmm. I hung out with him a bit, yeah. Mick. We was on, I went on the road with him. I had a solo record in, like, 89. And I did a bunch, of, just Steve Jones, I, was, I had a band and, and we opened up for Hunter Ronson around mm. the, the States, did about six or seven shows with him. And I hung out with him. I got on their bus a couple of nights and just chatted. And he was a sweetheart, Mick. Mm. In Hunter, of course, um, is, I mean, just uh, is so in love with Mick and says it to this very day mm. how he sort of really kept that band going with with um Mott the Hoople. well he actually joined them for 10 minutes mm. it was very brief mm. it didn't kind of work no oh, because he was turning up in some limo that de Vries right. had given him oh that's in the thing isn't it yeah. you got that in there yeah yeah and that was exactly. right what in the documentary do? what's it called the documentary it's called beside Bowie beside Bowie the story of me and how can you see it you can see it on um well it's coming out on dvd but it's also coming amazon out prime amazon prime on the 29th of january right available for purchase as well mm. what's that mean like a dvd i presume so you don't know i do know yes <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's a are they, you know i don't know exactly how amazon prime totally works but you buy it don't you or subscribe to it so in a way, it's all purchase, purchase, purchase. Yeah. Music, uh, Edgar Broughton all wanted it to be free, but it never got there, really. Mm. Let's play a mix song. We're going to play uh, Angel Number no. 9. We're here with John Brewer, who's uh, got the new Mick Ronson documentary out beside Bowie. Take it away, son. Carlo S. That was Jerry Rafferty. Baker Street. Before that was David Bowie, Gene Genie. From the album Lad Insane, and then Mick Ronson, Angel Number no. Nine, from Play Don't Worry, and we have the uh, direct tour, John Brewer, who just directed the Mick Ronson documentary. Now, what do you have to do with our uh, Jerry Rafferty, other than take his money? 
Well, actually, I gave him his money. Um, he made much more <laughs> than I did. Um, the thing is that uh, Jerry was introduced to me by a lady called Mafalda Hall, and she basically was Tony Hall's wife, and he needed a manager because he'd uh, been with Steeler's Wheel and A&M, and, &M, and um, I gave him the money to go make uh, Baker Street, done the album that you know now as City to City, and I looked after him, and um, he was he was a strange man, and he never really changed, um, unfortunately. Um, he didn't like decadence. He wouldn't want to meet me in my office. He wouldn't like to sit in my car, and he liked to be in the pub. And uh, But then he liked me because I built a wall in my garden, and he thought that was really good. Um, but uh, Baker Street, strange... Uh, I thought about this the other day, of course, because we're number one and have been for some time, which amazed me of being the greatest saxophone riffs in the world that were recorded. And I, you know, he stood his ground there, and of course, you know, Bowie... Who played the sax? Uh, Raph Ravenscroft. Was he a session guy? He was a session guy. He was very upset because he only got session fee. And I, he came back he, to He me. wouldn't have said that if it wasn't a hit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> But when he came back to me and asked me, I doubled the session fee. And then he wanted a royalty, and I said, that's up to Jerry. And um, Like publishing? Yeah, well, they, 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 he, he but, felt he was entitled to it. Well, the song is basically that riff. Well, I, Jerry would disagree with you, but, yeah, it's a very strong riff. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's interesting that he actually was never supposed to have played on it, and the guitarist was late. Oh, he was going to do that in guitar. Oh, it was done in guitar. Uh, 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 twang, 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 twang. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I, I live fairly near where that was recorded, and uh, it's a well-known fact that uh, the transportation, the train was late. And when the That's guitarist unusual. to turn up, yeah, it's unusual for England, of course, and uh, you don't really even get a train now. But, mm. um, what happened was that Raf said, well, I'll put a, a lead guitar sort of guide, mm -hmm. and that's where it came from. So he actually put a guitar down first, and the sax player copied it? No, it was a sax that he put down, and that's why he thought that that was arrangement was strong enough to say that was part of the song. But then the guitarist came in, and they tried it with the guitar, and it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So mistakes are sometimes the best things. Yeah, but both Accident, accidents. Yeah, you know? both are no longer with us, so they can have their argument wherever they are. And I'm sure Jerry is certainly still arguing. Raff is. Is he alive, Jerry Raffy? No, he's he's passed. Oh, he's dead. And so is Raff. Uh, uh, who's Raff? Raff Ravenscroft, who played the saxophone. It's a short version of Raffy. Well, that's I never thought about that. <laughs> I think his name was Raphael, which is a bit strange, anyway. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's the story there. He was um, quite amazing, Jerry. And unfortunately, um, when he, where there's a hit, there's always a writ, as there's I say. There's a writ, there's and a hit. There's a writ, there's a hit. Did he have any other hits? Yeah. Um, City to City was a hit. Um, Did that have a sax in it? No. He didn't try to capitalise on the old sax? No, it? otherwise we would have had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he had several. Um, and then, of course, Steeler's Wheel, we... we, we we sort of pushed that stuck in the middle with you yeah. and the film world has taken on Jerry now he's been in a lot of uh, and Steel as well and Steel as well in, yeah. in the uh, Joe Egan and, uh, what was the movie the Tarantino movie yeah stuck in the middle with you yeah when they were wearing suits Mr. Brown Mr. White yeah Reservoir Dogs, Reservoir Dogs. that's right and uh, I think it was actually he was referring to Jerry Moss and Herb Albert because he was overrunning A and M, and he was stuck in the middle. <laughs> oh, that's what the song, the lyrics were about. I, I think that's what I won't say 100, percent but it's pretty well 99. That's funny. Yeah, that's funny. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's good. I had to renegotiate the release from A and M on Christmas Day uh, because uh, Artie Mogul had signed, or was trying to sign him here. And it was all a rush situation. Yeah. And, uh, but now I take Christmas Day off. Yeah, that's yeah. nice of you. What about our uh, Bill Wyman? Bill. Uncle Bill, we call him. Yeah. Uncle William. What did you have to do with him? He basically got hold of me that just as the Bowie thing. I was moving from Bowie because the company sort of split up and I took all the rest of the acts. And Bill 
had a, guy, a band called Tucky Buzzard. They had a hit over Massive. There. Yeah, and Tucky Buzzard was a great band. And uh, that was what a stupid name. You yeah. didn't come up with that, did you? No. Okay. They, they, I, I tried to change it. Yeah, good. But I, I lost. I think it was four said no, and three said yes. What does it mean? It's a tucky, like turkey, tucky, tucky, Kentucky. I, I don't know. Buzzard, I know what that is. Buzzards were fashionable. I remember one had a buzzard that used to live on top of a cupboard in his. His room. What was the music like? What did it have to do with it? Anything? Was it was Stonesy. It was Stonesy. It was that Rolling Stones yeah. rift. Loose. Rhinestones on the velvet jackets from Granny Takes a Trip. Yeah, Trump. I used to love that shop. Did All, you ever go in there? Yeah, I, I had. Jean, remember Jean, the American yeah, one? I, I love Jean. You used to have a long fingernail. That's like right. A mile long that you used to put That's blow right. on. That's right. And apart from that, he used to sniff that stuff in a funny bottle outside. It was enormous. It was enormous, like a pint, a pint jug. And he'd sit there, and nobody knew he was doing anything wrong, but he was on a, the old ammo. And he'd sit on the step with that car protruding. Yeah. And I walked in one day, and Jagger was in there, and I went, hello, mate. He says, oh, this is too big for me, this jacket. Oh, it's beautiful. I'll buy it. And Gene said, thank God for that. He said, <laughs> Still have it. I went in there many times, and there wasn't even anyone in there. I think they were in the back, yeah. nodding out. Yeah, it's perfect if you're a shoplifter. Yeah, well, I, I don't know about that. I, I, that and a shop with a thing going round the wrong way, a clock at the end of it. Well you, done, yeah. Which you well know about. Well, that went on to be. Yeah. Vivian Westwood, but that was many shops. That was uh, too fast to live, too young to die. Let it rock. Then it was sex. Then it was seditionaries. And then it went on to be World Turn, Vivian Westwood. Yeah. I used to live in Portland Square between both shops. Or not actually yeah. further down the shops. Do you remember Alcajuras? Yeah, I do. And Zapata's, the shoe shop that was down the little... Uh, Zapata's. Was down the, the, the side street where the Rocky Horror Show cinema. That, there, was, there was a shoe shop down yeah, there. Yeah, I, I know exactly where that is. I, I, I would have thought you were too young. I was 15, 16. Yeah. I was always around there. Yeah. Well, there was another shop I'm mis I'm forgetting though. Mr. Freedom. Mr. Freedom was very much part of uh John down the road. Remember what was that place Lord called? John. It was a it was in like one of them antiquarius joints though. It was in a yeah, Kensington Market. Great Gear Trading Company. Okay, that yeah, that, that was, was up. It. And he started I I bought a military jacket off him. Actually, I bought two. One when I was Jimi Hendrix said to me, "You'd like to buy that." And I couldn't understand what Jimmy used to talk about. He just mumbled. And then I suddenly realised why, because he had one. And when I used to go down to speak easy, yeah. right, um, uh, he didn't like to be so conspicuous. He thought somebody else better buy one. And then, of course, the whole thing bloody well started all over the place. Uh, and then went again recently, I think. I see. What are we doing? We're we playing some music. We're going to play uh, Jumping Jack Flash because of Mick Taylor. And well, I went on to manage Mick Taylor. Oh, you did. And that day that he asked me, and we we signed everything up and everything, he took me to lunch. Or I took him to lunch actually, and he said to me, "I've got to tell you, it's really sad to tell you, but your first job is um, to sort out Mick Jagger." And I said, "No, I'm looking after you, not Mick Jagger." And he went, "Yeah, but um, I've left the Stones." Well, you could you should feel the vibe of my face must have dropped and hit the chair but the fact was i said that is not a very good career move mick yeah and he said i said we've got to repair that we're going back he said i'm never playing jumping jack flash not one more mick time. taylor mick taylor from the stones and he left the rolling stones how long had he been with him at that point since he was 18 never been into a supermarket they went to send people out to get his food he didn't know how to catch a plane did he ever make any dough <laughs> yeah. That sounds like no. Ah, uh, yes, and no. <laughs> I know when he left, he said, "Could you get onto the Stones' office?" Because I said, "I said," uh, he said to me, "I've asked for a Learjet to take me to Paris, and they won't give me one." I said, "But you left the band." Yeah. And he went, "Yeah, but they owe me money." I said, "That's beside the point. That's not how it works." But then I had to give him a, get him a deal with Sony. And but what? But didn't you? CBS. Didn't you have something to do with? Oh, um, Phil. Bill Wyman. Yeah, I did. Um, he, he left too. Yeah, but that so was Mick, way afterwards. But Mick, Mick Taylor left, right? He Mick didn't Taylor get the boot. Left. 
And same with Bill Wyman. They left. And Bill Wyman left. Bill Wyman met a woman that is still his wife. He had children. And he said, enough is enough. Yeah. Don't forget, Bill was... Uh, Charlie's the oldest, but Bill's pushing it. Was he, 75? Oh, I don't know. I lost count. 95? Not quite 95. 82. But he's still playing. 79. Mm. Is he? Yeah. He goes out with his band and plays, and he's a really still a lovely man, and he's a collector. You know, he's got pretty well all those stages that they used in the seventies, those he, fa- those big blue uh, animals that they used to blow up. He, the he bought that stuff. Well, or they I, let him have it. I think they let him have it, and he's still down at Heathrow. I wouldn't know what he's basically paying to keep it, but he's got all that memorabilia, and he knows every gig that they ever played. Yeah, and. Um, that's why, I mean, when I talked to him, it's amazing, amazing what he knows. And uh, long live Bill, you know. I, li- I used to like Bill Wyman in the band, the, the fact that he just would stand there, and that's it. And he used to have his bass up in the air because... His arms didn't reach it if he it If it was down. sideways, yeah. And of course, there's a famous story that I think I was in Chicago. I can't remember. It's not funny, really, but it's hilarious. And he basically was playing, and he, you know, he used you to walk forward five steps and then walk back five steps, and you basically walk, never smile. Yeah. And one day he got all his measurements of his steps wrong, and he went off the back of the stage. Yeah. And nobody knew he'd gone. Yeah. And they were playing on, and suddenly the <laughs> Jagger looks around here, where the hell's Bill gone? Yeah. And he was lying, and the stages are big, you know, he, he was lying on the bottom, and then they moved him off to, uh, he had to fly in here. He spent most of his week on his back, but poor Bill. But um, the fact they didn't know he'd gone was worrying. But um, there you go. Do you think he made any dough? Oh, Mr. Wyman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He still owns a, quite a big castle. Is that because <laughs> a beautiful of... house in Chelsea, just where you were talking about? Yeah, but that's not from publishing. That's just from going on the road. Is yeah. that where they make their dough? If you're not the songwriters? Uh, yeah, of course, because you know drummers. Drummers, you know, my son's a drummer. I said, for God's sake, write a song. Because yeah. you know what drummers are? They're the, the poorest of the bunch. I don't think they would have had it, though, uh, Jagger and Richards. I don't think they want any, anyone inputting and having another name on a song. Well, this is one of the reasons that Mick left. Yeah. I mean, Mick had uh, publishing on one song, I think. I can't remember what it was now. And uh, the, uh, Jagger and Richards kept that very close. Yeah. And it was the Glimmer Twins, and it was all that whole situation of basically writing songs together, until, of course, now we find out they they stopped talking and nobody knew. Yeah. Except them. Well, they wrote some great songs. Whoever mm. wrote them. Yeah, they did write great songs. Let's play uh, the Rolling Stones, Jumping Jack Flash. This is from the album Get Your Ya Ya's Out. We're here with John Brewer, who's just uh, who's uh, selling the. Uh, Mick Ronson documentary that's just come out. Take it away. Owns his jukebox on Carl OS. That was David Bowie again, Mick Ronson, Ziggy Stardust, and we had Lou Reed, Vicious, also with Mick Ronson. Um, God, hit- God, we miss him. Yeah. We miss them both, actually. Yep. That's for sure. But everything has to come to an end. Well, it hasn't come to the end. D- David's left 10 years of instructions. There's product coming. And did he, did I, he put me in the will? I, I never saw the will, but I wasn't put in the will. But Jones, if he, he, he might put you in the will, but if he didn't put me in the will... I then said hello to him once. You did? Do you know you pinched those symbols? I kn- you know what else I nicked of his? It was the microphone. Oh, that's well, you would have been cross about that. A little Electra Voice microphone with lipstick that was on it, on the end of it. How lovely. Yeah, he, um, he um, left instructions exactly. So you've got more product coming, and um, you've got a soundtrack off the film. And um, I really think it's a tribute to Mick Ronson, and I did it for Bowie as well, because they were really, really great together. Absolutely. <coughs> a great, great, um, made a lot of good rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Something we lack these days, I think. I mean, I know it's a different era, but they had great chemistry. He looked great too, Mick. Yeah, and he and he, he was wonderful. He was wonderful. And when you see those boys on stage and you look at them standing next to each other, 
arms around each other, everything else, they look the picture. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks for coming by, Mr. Brewer. I hope you feel better. Thank you. I've just... It's bizarre. I've deteriorated since I've been in here till now. Like, I feel like I'm full-blown... I have that effect. Flu. <laughs> Good, good luck with, Thank you, sir. with whatever you're doing. And you can, uh, if you want to see the documentary, it's on Amazon Prime uh, it's from Monday, January the 29th. And I think you can get DVDs of on it. On Universal, too. you know, it's going to be great. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thanks for coming by. Let's play. This. Yes, you're familiar with this band? I managed them, put them back together in St. Louis Obispo <laughs> with Keys to Ascension. And kept them together, and um, unfortunately, my best friend Chris left us. But um, they're out there still. Wakeman, uh, Trevor Rabin, and uh, the f wonderful new <laughs> freak when I say this, John Anderson. Yeah. But he's still hitting those notes. It's amazing. He has a really high pitched singing voice. Yeah. It's well, like, you know why that is. Go but on. We won't go. go we, on. we won't go into it. But Someone it, grabbed them. Yeah, well, no, I don't think they ever dropped. Squeezed them. <laughs> but God bless him. Put them in a vice. He's still out with the fairies. Thank God. Otherwise, we'd have a terrorist problem. Yeah. Well, let's play round, round, round. And Wakeman, of course. Roundabout. Yes. Jonesy's jukebox. Take it away.